Welcome to the Evolve WMMA podcast featuring women who go against conventional thinking to pursue their dreams. They are warriors who've gained respect by taking the reins and moving forward, creating progressive change in a male dominated arena. These women have inspiring stories to share, filled with real life joy, passion, blood, sweat, and tears. Hey, 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 this is Evolve Women's MMA, and I'm your host, Shelley Devine. This week's guest started her martial arts journey when she was only 14 years old, earning her black belt in Taekwondo. She later discovered a love for Muay Thai kickboxing and rose to fame after winning the one night 2007 hook and shoot women's grand prix with three knockouts in a combined time of just one minute and 45 seconds she's faced notable opponents like gina carano misha tate liz kamush julie kenzie sarah kaufman and leslie smith after over four years of absence from competition Young recently fought and won by a unanimous decision, and she's scheduled to fight at Invicta FC 32, facing Zara Friend Dos Santos. I'd like to welcome another pioneer in women's MMA, the striking Viking, Caitlin Rose Young. Yeah, good. Welcome. <laughs> So, so thank you for joining me today uh, on such short notice. It's awesome to have you on. I've heard so much about you from some of the other women that are fighting um, on Invicta cards. And uh, Oh, yeah. You've had quite a few on, huh? Yeah. Really trying to help get that featherweight division cooking, you know, like drawing Absolutely. to it, getting these women's names out there. And, and uh, they had told me much about you um, actually um, – seeing you at the, the, the tough tryouts and, and conversing with you. And now um, you're, you're fighting again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, it was, it was something that I kind of planned, you know, I'd been fighting Muay Thai the last uh, three or four years, but it was something that I was like, Oh, eventually. And then before my last fight, the tough tryouts came up and I was like, man, so, you know, working in Invicta, there well, for a few reasons, honestly, like there, there, uh, it would be a conflict to compete in some places and then and seeing the underside of some other places, I wouldn't want to compete there. <laughs> so, uh -huh. um, UFC was one of the few that, that would have made sense as was Ryzen, which is why I ended up fighting there. And, um, you know, just kind of after coming back, it made sense to just step down and fight while the window's open, I guess. Yeah, so let's refresh. You just came off of a fight. You, you, you've been on a hiatus um, from MMA right. for the last four years. And, yep. and uh, you just stepped back into the cage recently last month? Yep. Yeah. yeah. It feels longer for some reason, but yeah, about a month ago. Yeah, and, and you had a, um, a unanimous decision win. Yep. Congratulations. How did it feel? <laughs> How did it, it feel? Did. You know, like... The outcome obviously is what I wanted, but it was good to, uh, I just felt, felt really good in there. I've been feeling really good in my Thai boxing fights. Um, my hope was that I could transfer that to MMA, transfer the same mentality and, and it, it worked. So, uh, it was, I was both happy, happy and like, okay, now, now it's time to go get it. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, you have an upcoming fight now. It's in November, right? Or is it, it's November. November. Yeah. Yeah, November. So, um, you must be thrilled cause you're going back to Invicta Yeah. and you are on the, the, the first card, um, Invicta had its debut promotion. You mm -hmm. had a major brawl <laughs> with Leslie Smith. That was yeah. an incredible fight. And, um, and then, um, you know, you kind of, you had that draw and then, and then MMA wise, you kind of were a little up. Oh yeah. I went on a slide, a hell of a slide. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so was that part of the reason that you took, um, some time off? Well, I know you went to Thailand, but, um, was that, did that 
played a, a role in that? To yeah, well, it was one of those two where I was just I was, I was competing like so much better in the gym than I was in fights, and it didn't make sense. And it would be like I would do everything perfect, mm -hmm. and then my fight would be crap. And um, and that's not to take anything away from my opponents at that time. I just wasn't fighting yeah. my ability. Yeah, so I knew I needed to change some things up. I had actually moved to Los Angeles right before my last my last uh, Invicta fight before. So that was Invicta 9, I think. Um, but it was right before that. And then I had met a uh, Thai trainer, Cornpet, and started training Thai boxing with him. And it just sort of happened naturally. It was like, well, I should do some Thai boxing while I'm training with this awesome trainer. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't know that I set out to correct some of the things in that manner, but it's what ended up happening. Yeah, it's it's funny. I, I actually, um, when you were in Thailand, I think in 2016, you did um, an interview with uh, Sylvie Von yeah. Douglas, Douglas or something. I met her. I, I never know how to say her name right. But uh, and I, I'm, I'm like really bad. I'll be noted for like, she's the lady that just can't say anybody's name right. Um. And I'm like, okay, we know who you mean. <laughs> I'm like, I'm so bad at it. And, and I'm like, what the hell? But um, you you had an interview with her, and um, mm -hmm. and she you, you um, she was kind of um asking you about like you know the transition from MMA to Muay Thai, and I'm just gonna quote you because yeah. you could explain it a little bit more because um. I thought it was a cool statement, but um, well, when I was fighting MMA, there were days that felt like training was a chore. And since going back to Thai boxing, there has not been one day that I wasn't looking forward to training. And uh, for me, that was very significant. And I would train very hard in MMA out of discipline, but the desire was not the same. Can you go into more depth about the desire and the difference between the two for you? Well, I mean, I think part of it had to do with how, now in hindsight, part of it had to do not necessarily with the sport, but how uh, I was training at the time. Mm -hmm. Now I'm just taking, I'm with a new coach and I've taken more ownership over it. And um, I've been able to transfer that to MMA as well. Cool. Um, it's just a, a lot more guided and a lot more intelligent training and with a lot more, um, I don't know, like uh, success, I think. Mm -hmm. not, not to go, to, I don't want to bore the audience, but not to go too much into it. Oh, no. but I think, you know, when you're in a room, uh, when I had first started doing uh, MMA type stuff, I'd often be the lightest person in the room and my teammates were super strong wrestlers. Mm -hmm. And if you, everyday training, you're losing all the time and you're not used to winning. It's just not a, a way that's a way to train that's conducive to winning. Then how are you supposed to go do well? And your brain only knows that you're not winning. It doesn't know, well, of course you're not. This person's a hundred, you know, fights at 170 and they're uh, a, a stud wrestler. Mm -hmm. So I think um, changing up my training uh, has made all the difference in the world. And at the time, I thought it was only because it was Muay Thai. But I think I think a lot of it was the coaching and the style of training. Interesting. Wow. Well, so that's good. It took you a while to figure that out, but you, you yeah. got to figure it out and you kind of took a break and stepped away, which was, I think is like a huge thing to do if you if uh, you're not feeling it. Yeah. You know? And then and then finding the, the right path for yourself. That's great. So um, for our listeners, uh, some people may know you, some people may not, but um, you are quite the pioneer in women's mixed martial arts. You've been around for a while and you were, you've had fights against um, some of some notables like Gina Carano, um, mm -hmm. which, and, and then too, you were involved with the, the hook and sh hook and shoot. You, um, you won the um the oh, what is it the world's the women's grand prix yeah yeah and you really got you know kind of put on the map there you impressed tara la rosa all this sort of stuff um so can you give a like a little brief history of of your background just for some new listeners that are kind of like don't know who you are sure. and, and um just kind of give a refresh no it's funny you know i i think of like tara and Shayna as the pioneers so it, it's still funny to hear people say it, but I guess, yeah, I mean, I guess I have been around a lot longer than a lot of the ladies I 
most I oh sorry go ahead <laughs> i'm sorry too i should have interrupted but most people you know they know gina carano mm -hmm. and they didn't know tara i know tara back you know then oh, but yeah. i didn't i didn't know her or or um shana or any of them i kind of learned them through um um amanda uh, buckner mm -hmm. and she was involved in that but i don't know if she was in the same fight that you were in at all i think she might have kind of drifted off from that she, yeah, I feel like she in that? Wrong. I feel like she had her first, her last fight, shortly before my first one, or right around. Because I remember her fight with Tara Larosa was the first women's MMA fight I ever saw. I remember watching their fight. I think they were down in Costa Rica or somewhere. Bodog was putting on pretty good women's fights right. at the time. Um, but yeah, it's it's. Uh, it was a whirlwind, I'm sure, for you even, because that was a tournament-style fight that you were in. That that you know you had three fights in one one day or evening or whatever, right? Yeah. Yep. So I had had. So I did. Starting way back, I did uh, Olympic-style Taekwondo as a teenager, and then when I became an adult, I started doing Muay Thai. And after about two years of that, it was pretty dried up in the Muay Thai scene then, and. Uh, in the Midwest anyway, where I was. So it was like, well, why don't you try an MMA fight? Cause it was, you know, growing and whatnot. But this was at a time where they used to make women fight three minute rounds. They wouldn't let you fight five minute rounds. And when I say they, I mean the promotions. Bodog did and um, Hook and Shoot did, not in the tournament because it was tournament format. So they had to keep the rounds shorter, but in their regular fights. Um, so I had my pro debut in MMA in uh, October, I think. And I had one, I won a, a TKL and then I had the Bodog tournament or not Bodog, Bodog hook and shoot. I think they were somehow. They were somehow connected. They were connected on that. I, I'm With not Jeff sure. Jeff Osborne, he'd always been a, a big promo, proponent of women from, from day one. And it was three fights in one night. It was a little uh, funny because there were four 135ers and four 125ers and then the finalists fought each other so wow. I feel a little funny about the, <laughs> the final fight just being so much bigger but um so then I had that and then one more fight in it was like February or March and then I fought Gina on CBS uh and then I had a two-year complete uh dry spell I had a really tough time getting fights yeah, that was, I, I don't remember the year, it was probably 2006 Eight. or something? Yeah, 2008. It was even yeah. further up, it was getting closer to, um, I think, say, maybe even um, in, ooh, who started then? I don't know. But um, back then, you, when you fought Gina even, that was like kind of, they didn't even want to show, show you. Yeah. Your, your, your bruises or anything like yeah. that. They, didn't, they, they kind of stopped the fight, didn't they? He did, and I had spoken out about it, and, and you know, at 22, I probably wasn't real, I didn't think through how I should have said it as well, but yeah. I never thought I was winning that fight. People thought that's what I was arguing, and it wasn't. To your point, it was more, you stopped it early, because I had a ton of swelling, but it was under the eye. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was going to explode if it got hit again, because it was just like a huge hematoma. And I was later told um, off the record by execs that they did not want the women's fight to get bloody. So it, it had been actually confirmed. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that amazing that it, it, I mean, I can see that it would be like that for me. I'd be like, oh, let's see it. But like, mm -hmm. you know, let's see it go to, you know, the full, full fight or whatever. But um, it's amazing that it's changed in such a short period of, well, it has it is, a short period of time that that perception now has, has shifted, thankfully. Tons, thankfully, yeah. And it's, it's amazing to me that back then it was shorter rounds, stuff yeah. like that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, being asked to go put your hair down when you are at a, you know, a promo for your fight, stuff, yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. To now, um, it's maybe the only professional sport where men and women are paid very similar they get very similar uh media opportunities there isn't another one um 
Uh, yeah, yeah, no other sports are doing it this way. I mean, no. not at all. Not even like, I mean, you have uh, the, the, the race car driving with, I forgot the woman's name. The, Danica, right? Danica. Yeah, Danica. And I mean, she's, she is, but like, you, I mean, there, there is, I mean, tennis, but they're not, you know, and those are the only other ones that you're kind of playing, women are playing equally, but you're not having it in like, um, more team sports of like right. yeah. football or baseball or no and we have we have a killer women's basketball team up here yeah. um and they get like nothing like they won't even be they'll win a championship and not even be you know front page up here it's terrible i know would you watch them if they played would you watch them on tv like you know going out fight night or, or going out like for a sport like a football a you know i don't <laughs> I generally, I don't watch sports much. I love gymnastics. I shouldn't say that. I love watching gymnastics. So generally, I don't watch them a lot. But yeah, I would go just to support, just to kind of uh, drive the point home about viewers. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think I would too. I've heard other women say, oh, I would never watch women play, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking, huh, you wouldn't watch your daughter play? <laughs> you know, really? like if, if oh, she, man. you know, like when she's in school, you wouldn't go and watch her play. I'm like, what's the difference? You, if you saw her on TV, wouldn't you want to watch her? Or something? Right. And when I you yeah, that create bad. that, that opportunity for her. And I think yeah. sometimes I feel like, man, we are, we're 50% of the population. If we decide to make, make a stink about something, you yeah. know, decide to all start showing up for stuff, then yeah. the numbers don't lie, you know? Yeah, for sure. So I want to circle back to, um, you know, um, the, uh, the Muay Thai too is, you know, going back and, and, um, going back to Thailand and you trained over there. Did you fight when you were over there? Yeah. Yeah. I've had a few fights over there. I, well, the first time I went, I only had one. Um, and that was, it was a, a really good experience, but it was a trip. So, so the time I was with, uh, that I had met Sylvie for the first time. Yeah. Um, Who's just a doll, by the way. She's, she's oh, she's great. I saw her first fight in New York, and and then oh, okay. Her, and her first fight over in well, one of her fights in New York, I should say. I think it might have. It was an amateur fight, so it was one of her first fights. This is how I know her, and sure. um, and then she went to Thailand, and I went to Thailand, and um, didn't really and, and met her over there where she had a fight there, and she dropped the girl like a sack of potatoes with me, yeah. and. And um, she just said she couldn't get anything over here, and she because she's yep. so tiny, and she's like, I had to go there. And now she's just made it her whole career and her life and everything. She's she's pretty much there. But um, oh, yeah, I, yeah, really, really cool. So I I actually when I was doing some research on you, I was like, oh my god, she met Sylvie over there. Yeah. So what was it like being in Thailand having your fight? So that was really fun. I've had a, a couple sons, but the first time I went, <clears throat> there's some real cultural differences in a lot of things, but like, especially, um, in training and stuff. And I think this is hard for people to grasp when they first go like in America, when you're training at a gym, you, how do you, how do you get attention from the coach? It's always to work super hard. If you work your butt off, you'll get more help. You'll get more rounds, all this stuff. And there it's kind of seen as disrespectful if you're trying to take the control out of the trainer's hands, if you're not resting when they tell you to rest. And so it's interesting, the stuff that, that gets you help in each gym is different. Mm -hmm. And um, that took me a while to figure out. So I was actually really frustrated at first because they weren't pushing me at hard when I first got there. Mm -hmm. But um, it was in my best interest. They were trying to, you know, I had, I had, some time before I was going to fight and they wanted to build me up slowly. It's just a very different um, philosophy than I was used to. Yeah. And the gym I was at is Dejarat and Ajahn Surat speaks a little, like barely any English, but man, not much. So, um, and I was alone there. So I, it was like hard. You can discuss it with anybody, uh, but it was a great experience. The only things, like I said, it was tough because nobody knew when the weigh in time was. So I, I, I was like, well, I guess I'll go by myself and figure yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. And my opponent luckily spoke Thai and English, so she helped us get that ironed out. And then um That's good. They came and cornered and that uh oddly was fine with the language barrier. So uh and it was a it was awesome. I won a I think it was a third round TKO against against uh Chantel Ugi. 
Nice. But it was funny. Like all the boys came and I was like, oh, this is so sweet. Like all the boys came from the gym and then mm-hmm. it turns out they came to bet. Yeah, they do. They bet. <laughs> do they bet for you or against you? Oh, they bet for me. I was like, oh, well, <laughs> yeah, hey, it's a big but more of a vote of confidence. Yeah. <laughs> it's a huge pastime. That's what they all do is bet on, you know, like who's going to win whatever. It's yeah. huge. No, so it was really fun. And there was a, a guy who trains here in Minnesota was over there too. So, uh, like, just happened to show up at the fight. So it was a blast. We had a really good time. That's awesome. I, I, I spent some time. I spent, like, about a month over there um, back in 2009, 10-ish or something. And, oh, cool. Um, yeah, it was nice. I, I did um, a little bit in Singapore, some training there. Oh. But I got to see some fights up in Chiang Mai when I was up there. That's where I think I, yeah, I met. Did I meet? I met Sylvie up there. Yeah, I know she goes up there. Well, she lived up there at first when she went yeah. over there, didn't she? Yeah, that's where I met her. And um, yeah, it was great. Um, went to, you know, fight nights or whatever. But I didn't know when I first was there that, you know, women weren't allowed in the ring. They mm-hmm. had, they, they were that. just starting to allow women to get into Oh, that's right. Well, that was, that was and then it was like how you went into the ring was huge. Mm-hmm. Like you couldn't go over the ropes. You had to kind of go under them. Yeah. And then some of the gyms would have two separate rings. Yeah. When I went to where she, when I met her, they had separate rings, one for the girls, one for the bo- the guys. Cause it was somehow like, Oh, you can't be in the ring. You'll like curse. <laughs> something yeah. crazy. Yeah, I think honestly, it's like a superstition about him getting injured, but it was funny at, um, at Desert. We have to go under the ropes, but we didn't, they really don't separate you much. And I think part of that is they've had a lot of killer female fighters out of there. Um, like yeah. Sassings out of there, Chomany, like a, a, a bunch of them. And they are, you know, having, they, they coach the national team. So I think it's just having good female fighters around there. They're used to it. So there's a different, I don't know. I haven't trained enough gyms in Thailand to say, only well, trying their place, but it yeah. it didn't feel uh feel as like unequal as it sounds like a lot of places feel. Yeah, it, it, definitely the superstition, and I I sensed um when I when I was there it was very um feminine or soft culture, and I think that you picked up yeah. that in your training where they're like oh rest. I I just know from one of my coaches is like oh no, it's like. Go, you know, like nice and easy, you know, like not yeah. easy, but like breathe. Bye, bye, bye. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, take yeah. your time, chill, you know, like that stuff. And then too, um, when you're when you're kicking or like blocking, like you know, blocking a kick or whatever. They, it, my my coach at the time was like, yeah, we, you know, we do it. They train it, but he's like, you don't want to do it because you don't want to hit shin to shin. He's like, you kind of like you know, fake the person out and you pause and then you, then you find the soft spot to kick in or, you know, to break a rib or something like that, but not shin to shin, bone, knee to knee or whatever. And I just thought it was because he was like, no, that hurts too much. You're a Tyler, you don't want to do that. You know, they know. And I just thought it was the funny thing because we're like all like, yeah, hardcore, boom, hit them with, hit them with the shins. And I was going to say to you with that Leslie Smith fight. Oh Yeah. How did your shins feel after that? I mean, hers looked like she was probably, I was like, what did she feel? Oh like? my gosh. Yeah, my shins fine. were okay, but this is something people should just know. She has yeah. a super hard head. Um, <laughs> I, no, I'm not kidding. So I had uh, like two, I had fractured both hands, just not big, like like a hairline fracture, not bad ones. Wow. wow. And one was a knuckle and one was a hand, but she, uh, and then my friend Jessamine, you know, Jessamine Duke? Yes. And yeah. fought her. She broke her hand on her face too, like doing a jab. So <laughs> <laughs> and you it's think amazing. You know, it's like amazing. I'm like, man, how do you beat that person? And it just goes, comes forward, you know? Yeah. It's such a weird genetic thing with people. But it's awesome. You know, she has really good conditioning too. So yeah. she's one of those, she'll be a tough fight for, for whoever she's in the Absolutely, anybody. So, did you train at Ronda Rousey's gym, like with her? You did. Okay, you were one of that, like the pack. Yeah, you know, it's a, uh, it's one of those where I would mostly sparring is all we ever did, did together. I think at the, at the time, mm-hmm. and, you know, people in the gym. But yeah, I that was uh, the first place I went because my friends were out. Jessamine and Shana were there. 
Yeah. So, um, when I moved to LA, I, I knew I needed something to change. That's where I went originally. Uh huh. Um, and they were a little bit more of a boxing heavy gym and they were, they were so sweet to me. They were great. Um, mm -hmm. but it wasn't, I, it's, it wasn't what I needed. I don't think so. That's when I, uh, ended up moving on. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So you definitely um, made the dots to different people that are really significant in the development of women's mixed martial arts, for sure. You, you've, you've, touched, you, you've touched gloves, <laughs> so yeah. to speak, with, with these other women, which is really huge. Um, so you, you have this fight coming up um, with, with Zara Farron. Mm -hmm. Santos, and I, um, I had a chance to interview her, and I know you were out. Oh, at cool. Yeah, you were out at Tough uh, 28, so you get to kind of scope out the territory. Did you have that in your mindset? It's like, if this don't go down here, it's going to go down elsewhere or <laughs> something? Like we used to no, go honestly, I mean, a little. Like, but yeah. I watch every fighter that way. I watch men that way. Like, how would I beat that person? <laughs> so, okay. um, it's, but it was more, uh, I figured if I didn't get in the Tough House, I was scouting for uh, matchmaking. It was like, oh, I get to see, you know, who's here, who looks good you know, it would be a good addition. And it was, it was actually really nice to see so many featherweights show up mm -hmm. because I know that the common argument is, Oh, there aren't enough featherweights. And, um, you know, it's just like anything that it, there are definitely more than they make it sound like. And then if they build the opportunities, yeah. then they'll be more likely to, yeah. To continue to shuffle over there, you know, if there's no opportunity, nobody's going to come from boxing or judo or jujitsu or wrestling, you know. Um, but I think now having that, hopefully, hopefully, that happens because there are women. I mean, what weight is Clarissa Shields fighting? One sixties, I think. Yeah. I Not know. that there aren't aren't yeah. big, strong athletic women. There are. They just uh, need to make their way over to MMA. I think. Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I, well, looking at the, the car that they put together for the tough 28 show, I was like, Oh, they got a lot of bantamweights in there. Not, yeah, they do. but to the advantage of Invicta, at least now, you know, Invicta can promote them. Yep. No, yeah. there's a happen, happen, uh, featherweight and that'll hopefully continue to build. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm looking forward to, um, this fight card that's coming up. In, in November. And I was, you know, psyched to see they have two featherweight fights on there that are actual featherweight fighters. I know. No, I know. <laughs> Me too. I'm, I'm excited that I'll be, be able to eat some food while I'm just watching Pam and Felicia. I'm excited to watch that one. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. I mean, but it was crazy. Yeah. A tough tryout. Some of those girls, cause they weigh you right when you show up, you know, mm -hmm. and some of them were, uh, super light, super light. Uh, yeah. So it's, it's interesting. It, it, it makes me wonder what their plans are for the featherweights and, I, and not in a good way, you know? Yeah. And I mean, even if, you know, um, Cyborg has, you know, I think two, two uh, fights left on her contract and it, and it doesn't sound like she's too thrilled with, with um, how they've right. handled her and what fights they've given her. They haven't really challenged her. I think the way mm -hmm. she should be challenged with somebody who's actually, in her weight and you know trying to make yeah. her cut weight or whatever you know like and but i think it's just you know it, it has to change and it will um we'll just see you know she could go fight someplace yeah. else yeah with that. yeah well it just needs it's just gonna take a just a little time i don't think too much yeah but, but yeah to your point a, a lot of the women that have fought her have been bantams coming in last minute to do it yes not not even bantams that have Tanya Avenger. Yeah, I know about out. this three months in advance. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And then people are like, oh, she's nothing. I'm like, are you kidding me? You have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you have no yeah, idea. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, it's just going to just hang on. Just take, just wait a minute, you know, be patient. So how did you get into matchmaking with Invicta? How did that all occur? Honestly, Shannon just called me up one day and was like, what are you doing these days? You know, and it, I had just gotten back from Thailand uh, the first time, uh -huh. just, just gotten back. But um, I'd done some matchmaking locally for kickboxing. So I uh, dipped my toes in, though, though matchmaking on a local level is a pretty different animal than 
like within Victor or an international show. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, she just asked me what I was doing. You know, initially I came in to sort of do the job in conjunction with Julie. So that was great. Like having Julie and I were friends. We fought a couple of times, but we're also pretty good friends. So uh, we worked together. She kind of showed me the ropes and, uh, nice. and then when she completely stepped down, it was, it's really been great, uh, working with Shannon. Mm -hmm. She's been in the sport a super long time. Yeah, I know. Has some incredible insight. Yeah. So getting the opportunity to learn from her has been great. Yeah, I can imagine. She, I mean, she started with, I think, Strike Force. She was, she was matchmaking for them, I think. Yeah, I know she was doing, uh, athlete relations or could have been matchmaking too. She's done matchmaking for, I think a couple different organizations and she might've even been working with a smaller show prior to that. Maybe it was IFL. You remember? Yes. Remember yeah. Them? So, uh, yeah, she's had a, a pretty storied career prior to Invicta even. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to meet her at some point. Cause I think we'd have a lot to talk about. <laughs> oh, I think so too. She's, she'd be a great interview for sure. Yes, yeah. I think I figure maybe I got to get a few more of these under my belt and then she'll give me some time. I know she's a very busy lady. Oh yeah. Um, so I, um, I have like a whole bunch of questions for you. Okay. Yeah. Did you get a chance to look at, like I sent you like, um, yes, I did. Okay. I didn't want to surprise you with anything. Oh, no, no. I, I mean, yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah. I like, I like it. So you kind of have an idea so you can kind of think your thoughts through a little bit, but, um, what kind of goals do you have for the next three, three years, personal and uh, business wise? Ooh, that's a uh, good question. So when I re retire from fighting, whenever that may be, I do, plan to come back to matchmaking. Um, but prior to that, I want to, you know, the, the vague answer to that is I would like to get to the level that I should have been fighting before, how I feel I should have been fighting before with my potential. Mm -hmm. um, I want to get to the top of the division. Nice. So that's, that's that for as far as fighting goes. Uh, on the other side of things, though, I've been matchmaking Muay Thai in Minnesota, and I want to help that sport continue to grow as well. Mm -hmm. It's uh, always been super near and dear to my heart, obviously. And, you know, I think uh, we have a matchmaking for a show up here, a driller Muay Thai still, and we have four shows nice. scheduled for next year. So, Will it be tournament style, do you think? Or? Uh, we, we've considered doing a tournament. They've been mostly single fights. Yeah. Um, and again, with that, really making an effort to have both men and women represented. You know, we've had some cards that are, they're about half and half. And it's honestly mostly based on availability. Mm. We have a lot of tough ladies up here. Uh, we have, I think, four on our team that have more than 20 fights. Wow. Women. So, uh, amateur great. still. So, they'll be coming up and, and just kind of helping our my team do their thing. As well as the other uh, talented fighters around here. That's so. awesome. Cause I was just speaking with, um, a woman I met in New York, uh, cause I was at one of the BJJ that the Pan Ams in New York. And, oh, oh, cool. And, and, uh, she was saying that, uh, they're starting some sort of Muay Thai tournament. Like they'll have like three rings going and something. And I was like, Oh, we got to find out more about that. She said yeah. it's an uprise again. Cause I know there was Muay Thai was pretty big in New York, uh, back, I don't know, to early 2000s and stuff, yeah. like and a little later than that, you know, but I haven't heard too much about it. And there's even like an insurgence now, like with it happening, even in Massachusetts, which we really didn't have it at all. Really? We'd have to, we'd have to travel. People here had to travel either to Rhode Island or to New York. And then they, they kind of, if they were going into New York, they were a little like, I don't know. Those girls are going to rip us apart because we didn't have like any competing happening. Right. And that matters. Like if you're competing, it, does. it matters. Yep. Totally matters. So now seeing it, I mean, before it used to be just out in California, you know, you'd yeah. hear about it out there and then now, well, I guess the Midwest and now here it's starting. Oh, thank goodness. Up. Yeah. Which thank goodness. Cause you're right. Like, Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, hmm. you didn't. You didn't at all. I think I just had like a little ding come in. Sorry. <laughs> We, yeah, we, I feel like I've been just kind of left out here in the Midwest of the bigger shows, which is understandable. You know, it's really hard to sell tickets 
that far away from home yeah. until you get a bigger name. Right. But there is a lot of, a lot of talent here. Just like I'm sure there was in your area, but if it's not being developed, it, it doesn't yeah. go anywhere. You can't show anybody. Yeah. And the opportunities just kind of go away and you're like, Oh wow, we need somebody to kind of run shows to, to get these people. But then it, it all takes, you know, somebody to have some sort of funding yep. <laughs> to do it. No, and, exactly. And yeah. we have uh, a guy named Jeremy Bjornberg and he actually promoted, uh, he's been promoting MMA in the area. He said, I think around 60 shows total with boxing, MMA, and now Muay Thai. But he, I, I'm working with him and luckily uh, his company has been, been backing it. Uh, to help kind of transition it in. First, we were doing shows that were MMA and Muay Thai. Now we've had some Muay Thai standalone shows. So it's, it's, it's rolling there, but yeah, definitely. It's not something I would have been in a position to just do by myself. Right. Wow. Yeah. It's, it's hard to get those, those shows going and keep them going. I mean, you know, you've been, you've been to shows that, that there are promotions that no longer exist now. You know, tons, right? Tons. Yeah, there's tons of them that just you know they they were there, they were great, and then they're they're gone. You mm -hmm. know, um, do you have any personal habits or a daily routine that contributes to your success as either a person, a fighter, however you want to, you know, kind of answer the question? Uh, the biggest habit I've picked up that has been helpful is what I call hard prioritizing. And when I'm thinking about sometimes the smaller things, sometimes the bigger things in my day, is this going to help get me closer to the goal or not? And sometimes that's really difficult, right? Like your friends want you to go out for a drink, but you have a fight coming up. Is this going to help me with that? No? Well, then probably not. And there are things closer to a fight, I'll be more strict about that. Mm -hmm. um further out it's like okay you do need some time to to mentally relax and whatnot but getting in the habit of being able to do that because it was really helpful for me i'm somebody who can really start taking on too much and put too much on my plate and well i suppose i could go do this thing it's like yeah but you need to be resting so um i think being a little bit more it's not even selfish. It's just per uh, making decisions with more purpose mm -hmm. has been a habit that's helped me a lot. Mm. So you get really clear, like on what you want to do. How do you, yeah. how do you, how do you prioritize? Like, I mean, when, you know, when you really like, I mean, you have your goal and what are, you know, like some little key things that can keep you from being confused, I guess, about, you know, oh, should I do this or that? Especially when it comes to training, if you're a fighter, yeah. you know, like you could be like, oh, how do I know to train with this person as opposed to that person or, or that coach over this coach and really kind of narrow it down? How do you get clear about that? Uh, part of it can be results, you know, um, training partners, for example, what's the likelihood I'm going to get injured? You know, that's a big one. Yeah, that's huge. Uh, if you're trying to decide between, it's like what we'll do when we're getting ready for a camp is I'll, um, I'll bring somebody in for the specific drills. It's for that day. It's what, you know, uh, what the way we're doing it with corn pet. Um, mm -hmm. So, and it can be hard, right? Cause like you don't want to, for instance, you don't want to hurt somebody's feelings or whatever, but if they can't push you and they could potentially injure you, mm -hmm. You can say it nicely, but you have to prioritize that. So that's, um, that can be a tough thing. So yeah, a lot of the time it's usually just sitting down with myself, you know, in my head, of course, <laughs> listing one, two, and three, what are the most important things that need to happen today? And they have to happen in that. They have to take precedent in that order. Um, wow. And it's a tough thing. It's, it can be a tough thing to stick to, but it, it's really helped me a lot. Yeah, that's really cool. That's a great piece of information. That's awesome. I'm like, huh, you know, because sometimes, I mean, I'll write down my list and, and I don't put them, you know, I should reorganize them. Now you can do it all on your phone. Like, okay. Yeah, right. It's so nice. 
Yeah, yeah. The, and then, uh, you know, you I forgot what it's called. It's like a little app. And it's like, oh, maybe I should move this one up and do that one first, mm -hmm. you know, like instead yeah. of the other ones, the other things that you have to prioritize. That's really, that's actually a really nice, helpful tip. Wow, mm -hmm. I like that. Yeah, I think it probably transfers to anything. You know, I've been yeah. using it mostly to fighting, but whatever yeah. your primary goal is. Yeah, for sure. Can you tell us or share a story um, along your martial arts journey where you have experienced an aha moment of realization? Yes. So it's really hard for me to s No, you know, when I think, I'm trying to think when I would say it was. Um, when, I, as I said, when I was in MMA, I was doing everything perfect and then not having good fights. Mm -hmm. And it was training in Thailand. I don't remember the day, but understanding that you can't control everything and it doesn't need, it doesn't need to be perfect and you can still perform like that need to control is it's, a, it's an anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't help with performance. You can still, you know, it's just like any job. If, if you're an accountant and you can't do that job unless everything's just right, then you're not much of an accountant. Mm. Um, and I think learning to let go because over there, you don't know what's being said to you. The trainers mess with you, you know, they'll, they won't tell you how many, or they'll tell you that you <laughs> don't have 10 left and then you end up doing a hundred more, like whatever. Right. Yeah. And I think that's by design. I think it's to make, especially we Americans, because we can be so worried about that, make us let go and just, you're going to be super tired and look like crap and in training and, and that's just too bad you got to just let go of it uh, but in doing that I think that's where real confidence comes from nice that's a great answer that that just makes me think of when I was over there and they would trip me and put me on my ass I don't know doing pads yeah we're, we're gonna do pads and I'm thinking and then all of a sudden I go flying on my ass and then they start laughing at me and I'm yep. like what <laughs> you know? oh, exactly and you can't you can't be perfect in those yeah. conditions. No, yeah. you just have to roll with it. Yeah, yeah. It's really funny. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. So um, is there a time in your journey where you experienced failure and uh, what did you learn from it? Um, yes, many times. I've had uh, a very public career because I had a big fight so early. You know, it was eight months in. So... Um, Everybody has seen my triumphs and failures pretty, you know, not, not so much the Muay Thai because it falls under the radar. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there are a lot of things I learned, but I think the thing that'll, that has helped me the most is learning how to maybe help other people through that, that sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have a really bad attitude about failure mm -hmm. in America, particularly in fighting. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, one or two losses and everyone's like, oh, when are you going to retire? And I would understand if you're getting like knocked out cold. We've all seen that or somebody it's like, no, you're taking too many shots to the head. But if you're, you're losing decisions and you're okay, mm -hmm. yeah, you're struggling. You're having, you're, you're not uh, performing the way you should, but it's not dangerous, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I think not getting so beat down or beating myself down about losses or screwing up was another big part of it because then you don't bounce back then it turns into streaks and my record is a great example of that I mean you could look at my earlier record and be like a streak of wins streak of losses streak mm -hmm. of wins streak of losses mm -hmm. and not until recently would I yeah if I drop one up whatever bounce back I don't get so bent out of shape about it but that took a lot of work a lot of mental work for me mm -hmm. Yeah, I've heard a lot of the other women um, that I've had on the show speak about that, that, that mental game kind of thing mm -hmm. and kind of, um, uh, what do I want to say, um, nurturing or, or cultivating a stronger mindset yep. and, and developing that where I think, you know, in sports, when we're younger, um, depending on what we've been able to experience as maybe a team or, or if you're in boxing or something that's a yeah. single kind of sport where it's just yourself, tennis or anything like that, um, the opportunities haven't been there for women. And, and it's yeah. really this, this generation, uh, you know, like since maybe the sixties or something that it's kind of been happening for women, that it's been mm -hmm. the slow progression of um, us 
shifting in our mindsets of what we're able to do and, and then shifting yeah. culturally what, what um, we're perceived as capable of doing as women. And, and part of it is the mindset and learning how to train it as well, like, like the men do, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah we can do that. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I think you are 100% spot on and you see it. Um, I'm sure you've probably read or heard about this somewhat. You see it even in the way that sometimes people talk to young girls versus little boys is oh, different. If a little boy does, doesn't do well on a test. It's okay. You just need to work. Hard. It's okay. You can get past it. You just need to work harder. And, uh, the way young girls are often spoken to, it's you're a smart girl. You're a good girl. You are this thing just because you are not because you've, you've developed it or you're going to develop it. Uh, or, or even more degrading it's like oh you could go to beauty school or you yeah well you could just, yeah exactly a, a mom you know like in, in like even degrading what a mother does like you could absolutely like yes absolutely and and i i know i know i felt that when you guys are younger than i am but we're like i i know i had those things said to me along the way oh i'm sure and I'm like, and, and, it, and I've seen the progression of change that has happened, but wow, you know, like you're like, and you think oh. that's the norm and you think that's the way it's supposed to be. I mean, that's that. And then you start to, you get out of say your, um, you know, your town or your, wherever your school systems or wherever mm -hmm. you've heard these things, your work, your culture, and you start to go out in the world and you find, okay, there's a little bit of a difference going on here. There's other people that oh, yeah. don't think this way and which is an amazing thing. And I think, you know, part of the thing is yeah, martial arts opens the doors for that in a very unconventional way. It's hugely unconventional. I mean, you were a part of that. They didn't want to see your bloody face on, on yeah. national TV, you know? And, no, you're and right. That wasn't that long ago. No, it wasn't. 10 years, right? And I've yeah. heard that from people. I don't know why a woman would want to fight or, you're, you know, and this is my favorite one. Mm. When you say you're fighting or you have a fight, or even you take some damage. Well, aren't you worried about ruining your face? Um, <laughs> There's always one too. And first of all, the fact that your, what your nose looks like is more important than what is going on with your concussions <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. is bad enough by itself. But then also uh, so much worth of a woman's worth can be assigned to her appearance yeah. uh, by society. And unfortunately I've gotten more of that, I think from uh, older women yes. than anybody really. Yeah. Um, and I don't think it's, it's not meant in a mal malicious way. It's just, no. I think they say it because that's what they would worry about, which is yeah. kind of heartbreaking, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. To not chase your dream because oh man what it might do to your face you know i don't know yeah i i mean like i can remember growing up and naturally being a fighter but i never discovered like really innately discovered that until i was in my mid-40s that mm -hmm. i had that and and i was like wow it took all that time for me to figure that out. And then, and then I had to nurture it in myself, you know, like to, to go and go train and all that. So it was really fascinating to me, you know, the, just this mindset of how women can keep us not evolving as, mm -hmm. as women in, into yeah. doing other things that are, you know, like that following your dreams, what you right. want. You know, not that I wanted to do that, but it was a part of myself that I didn't even know existed. And I'm thinking, what would I have done earlier on? What, what other yeah. things would I have done if, if society didn't have that kind of thing? And I think now, it, you know, it's much different, but there's still some things that, that aren't yeah. happening. And this featherweight division really reminds me of it. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm like talking. Oh, about you. Yeah. Because it's, it's like, there's still the, this perception that there are, there are no female fighters. And I see it in threads on Facebook, on Twitter, everything. There are no female featherweight fighters that could fight, you know, cyborg that would give her even a, you know, there's just, there's nothing, there's no depth. And we heard this before. We mm -hmm. heard this before Ronda Rousey took, you know, and 
got the band yeah. division going and everything. And now, yeah, they've said it about everybody. Yes. And, and it's so funny. And I'm like, hello, wake up with the light bulb on, you know, like it's very just, uh, yeah. Well, you know, they're going to learn. <laughs> Yes, but, very soon, very soon, sooner than later. It's really coming. I can see it coming now. So, but yeah, to your point, I, you know, I've even, I've gotten that sense from, uh, so my grandmother obviously was dealing this way earlier, um, but sort of, man, I, w I wish this kind of stuff would have been an option for me. And just like, you like had, what if, what if when you were 18, it was an option. You didn't, you had no idea because it just wasn't presented and you don't see it. It's different when you see it. Yeah. Um, as a young girl, I think in particular now, man, like we have young ladies coming up and there are a few of them in Invicta where they're eight, they're turning, they're fighting pro when they turn 18 because they've been competing since they're young already. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? It's awesome. And it's not going to be long until you can't, yeah. you can't enter at 20. You know, it's not, it's not, going to be long anymore yeah when when you were in thailand did you see children uh compete young, mm -hmm. young kids yeah I fought in a car to some kids uh, so i did i went back again the following year and i fought in isan so uh way out in northeast thailand and i was on a card with a bunch of kids wow and they're betting against the kids <laughs> yep. no it was yeah. it was interesting for sure but um how did you feel about that, knowing that in this culture, it's probably a bit frowned upon that children yeah. are, are boxing at that and kickboxing at that level? Like, I mean, they're young. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, they are. Um, For head injuries, trauma to the head, you know, yeah. we have that football, you know, we're protecting the, the kids now with the football injuries and, and trauma to the head. And whatnot. Yeah. Well, I think, like, it's, well, first of all, Thailand Muay Thai is, a little bit less focus on headshots anyway than you see in the states so there's that but beyond that i don't i know people get really uh bothered by it but i don't think they quite understand what kind of poverty is in a song mm -hmm. and with that level of poverty it, it's not like in America where you can be broke and still find a way to end up becoming a doctor one day, you know, you can still get scholarships. Yes. You're still going to have setbacks, but you can possibly come out. It's not like that in, in truly poverty stricken areas. Mm -hmm. So yes, I suppose that is a risk for the fighting, but they might have a better life overall if they become a good fighter who can then take care of themselves and their family or can even become a good trainer and have a far better life. I mean, uh, my trainer, Corn Pat started fighting professionally at the age of 10. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, and now he's living here and, and training fighters and his whole family uh, has benefited from, from his fight career. Yeah. So to say, I, I don't, when people get upset about it, I don't think they, can fully grasp what they're talking about because I don't know that they've seen it. Yeah. Honestly. Yeah. I know. I, I know I've seen it. So I, mm -hmm. I understand it and I, and I get it. Like I completely get it and I never had that kind of feeling, but it's nice to hear other people explain it who, who have been there mm -hmm. and they see it and they understand it. And it does provide for the family for sure. You know, like for the mm -hmm. entire family, one child could provide, you know, a year's worth of salary in one fight for, for their whole family. Whole well, and the, not the, quite drug use. Anymore, but. Mm -hmm. the drug use, if it, if it keeps them out of the drugs and stuff in a son too, uh, I think Yaba is pretty, pretty rampant. And, uh. and, uh, you know, there was a girl, young girl who was at Desiree last time I was there, she was in her teens and she's fighting, um, and I remember it being a big deal. Somebody on Facebook found out how young she was and making a big deal. And it's like mm. being a fighter is not the worst thing that can happen to you. Yeah. Well, they could be um, you know? sex trade. Exa you know? Exactly. It's exactly. huge over there. I can't even believe it. I mean, I know when I was over there, I was like, are you kidding me? Like, I know. Baby, babies. I'm like, I, I had a daughter. I have a daughter, <laughs> you know, that I'm no, I, you know, I, like, I, and you think this could be my own child, you know, this, that she's just some just giant, disgusting German guy. Yeah. yeah it's terrible. Exactly. Yeah. 
Exactly. It would be all uh, Farangs coming over and, mm -hmm. and, and taking advantage of, of these young kids. Kids. Yeah. Like, you know, paying them, but still, it's like, are you kidding yeah. me? Yeah. No, it's brutal. Just, you know, like, I don't even know. Yeah. Yep. But, but that's, that's, that is the alternative. I don't know what it's like still over there, but I know it was kind of bad. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think I've actually heard from some trainers, they feel like fighters are getting softer now because it's, because the economy is shifting a little bit and there are other options. So it's not, they don't need to fight anymore. Yeah. Wow. So it changes the, uh, changes the game a little bit. It'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah, that is interesting. So um, do you have, what has been your greatest challenge uh, when dealing with fear mm. and how do you overcome it? Because I know a lot of fighters, when they're going into the cage, they have that, like, I mean, they definitely deal with fear going into the cage. Yeah. I've heard so many fighters talk about that. So, I mean, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, stepping into the cage or the ring or anything mm. like that. It could just be fear in general, you know, your, and how you deal with it. Ooh, I think... I think most fighters would tell you this too. It was always for me, it was more of a fear of underperforming than it was a fear of getting hurt uh, or anything ever. So, and what's hard, right, is that you have this fear and then that fear gets solidified when you do underperform. And it does, um, it stings, you know? So it's, it's getting over that was a challenge. And it's not that you don't have concerns. It's not as though I don't have concerns now ever, but it's a, a much different feeling. So that took a lot of work. And frankly, I think fighting internationally is what, what helped me with that mm -hmm. because it's so out of control that you just can't control anything and you just have to basically shut off your mind <laughs> and not think about mm -hmm. underperforming because you better, you know, you, you better just get out there and, and do it. There's not much to think about because it's already so insane. Mm -hmm. And I, I, even with our uh, fighters coming up, usually early in their pro career, I think it's best for them to compete internationally, late in their amateur, early in their pro career, because it, I think, gives people a, a mental edge in dealing with BS, whether it be their own or, or someone else's. That. <laughs> Wow. Then, it, then it becomes old hat and it's easier to, to move on. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Um, do you have uh, three, maybe a couple of things that you say are essential to your success as it leading an empowered life? Yeah, I think, um, not being, you know, it's so cliche, but just not, ever making yourself small, you know, like not being, you know, it's absolutely important to be considerate and care about other people, but to never not do something because it's going to make somebody else uncomfortable or bothered. And that can be the smallest thing that can be, you're still trying to win at sprints, even if somebody's going to be upset that you beat them, <laughs> mm -hmm. or it can be, uh, uh, something bigger, you know, taking steps in, in your own career. Mm -hmm. It can be anything. And I think that's important for all of us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So did you like, um, who, who's been like an inspirational person or what, what has inspired you in your life? Like somebody that, you know, role model or someone that has kind of, uh, you know, led that kind of giving you that kind of inspiration to to be who you are in the fight game or in life in general life um i think in a lot of ways my my father was absolutely great for him for me and for uh sort of the the way and he he passed when like shortly after i started doing martial arts hmm. i was 16 but he was so um supportive and in a way that gives you gives a kid the sort of confidence to uh and particularly a girl in the male dominated sport to well i don't care if you guys are upset that i'm here i'm here um he would take me hunting and stuff when we were kids and i remember being very young and he said his friends didn't want me to come with because i was a daughter and not a son and 
told me this, you know, I was 11 or 12, I think. And he was like, well, but that doesn't matter because you're a better shot than their kids anyway. So, yeah. But having him, I think, reinforce that has carried mm-hmm. into my life in a lot of avenues. Hmm. That's awesome. Do, now, do you have other siblings? Do you have sisters or brothers or? Yes, I have um, a half brother and a half sister and a stepsister and a full on sister. So, yeah. We're kind of uh, scattered about, but yes. Okay. So, I mean, did your dad have like a son or? Yes. Yeah. So, and, and he took you both hunting. Or just, no, yeah. actually. <laughs> now I you're going to get the whole story. Yeah, I'm getting a dirty. <laughs> no, uh, I didn't actually meet my brother until my dad passed away. Or I didn't really get to know him. I met him once before. Um, but he and my brother's mom were not together. And I think until my brother was a little bit older, he didn't even know he was raised with somebody else at first, uh, as if it was his father. So, okay. But that's pretty cool that your dad gave you that support and even like went against, he even said, too bad I'm taking my daughter hunting, you know, like, yeah. And he was very, uh, very much just sort of laughed at them for it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they say the voice your parent speaks to you and becomes your hmm. becomes your inner voice, so to speak. Yeah. So I mean, when when he did that and he told you that, what did you think as a young girl? I mean, what was? I mean, I think then you're kind of like as a young kid, you're like, oh, okay. Oh yeah. Is it gonna make you? I feel like I remember being a little uh, feeling a little weird going after that, but I don't know. But I didn't like. I felt, uh, you know, he made sure I felt comfortable there. Of course, nobody would ever say anything like that to you. You know, they would just act whatever. So maybe I had a little chip on my shoulder that I had to show them up. Yeah. Yeah. I hope you caught something when you were out with them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I did. <laughs> you know, I got the, the, the four point buck <laughs> you know? yeah. or whatever. Yeah. I don't know what you guys went hunting for, but <laughs> no, yeah, it was gross. And yes, uh, I would get up earlier and go out by myself. And I think usually I was more successful because nice. of that. That's cool. So um, the whole father thing too, where your father passed away. How, I mean, how old were you when that happened? I was 16. Yeah. So that's really young to lose your dad. Yeah. Wow. So you um, definitely had a strong connection with, I'd say Rhonda because she lost her dad too young. I mean, you guys must've had like some sort of like, a, you know, like, you know how you attract like certain people in your life and they have similar storylines. Did, did you, did you kind of, were you aware of that in the, in that uh, period of time when you, you were training, we'll say with Rhonda and, and um, Jessica and um, Shana? I wasn't aware. I don't think I was aware of that until after I moved uh, out of LA actually. Yeah. But um, you know, it was, it, it was of course cool to be just in a room with uh I guess sort of that a bunch of ladies with that same attitude. Yeah. Like, well, I don't, I don't really care how you feel about it. Yeah. <laughs> this is what I'm doing. Uh, and she was, yeah. she's great in that way. And I think something that we can all take from her in her career is just because it hasn't been done doesn't mean it can't be. Right. And that's something she's proven uh, over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, she's recreating herself again, yet again, mm-hmm. you know, which is cool. And, and, um, it, it looks a little like you will be too. You're coming back, you know, like into the fight scene again and, mm-hmm. and starting anew. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is really, really cool. Um, and, and seeing where this featherweight division will go and where you will go hopefully in it, you know, yeah. <laughs> it's going to be, it's kind of, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see how it all unfolds. Cause it's just such a, sometimes it's such a mystery, but it usually has like some really cool twists and turns as, oh, yeah. as it lays out. It's, it's kind of fun to watch. Um, so your, your, your folk, well, your, your dad kind of was a good support system for you. So what, what now maybe keeps you up at night? 
Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah. Um, it keeps me up at night. I just, I feel like I'm very much on a mission to fight to my potential, you know, mm -hmm. um, and to try to make changes that I, that I personally want to see, you know, um, it's bothersome that the, the only women we're seeing are the lighter divisions and, and there isn't a heavy, a heavyweight. Why is there, you know, if you can't make under 145, you're not making money and fighting as a woman, period. Yeah. Yeah. And if they take away 45, it's 35. Yeah. And as a result, it pushes everything down. So uh, I do feel pretty fired up about that. Like apart from, apart from the fact that I want to do, do my own stuff and accomplish my own goals in fighting, mm -hmm. uh, I feel like there's a little something to prove there. Yeah, I feel like you're still forging a path. Like you're forging a path now for featherweights. I mean, you you're integral in in actually helping the rise of women's MMA, um, getting into the UFC. Say, all right, you're you you were involved in 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 that process, and now it's like okay, we got to get this featherweight division going because mm -hmm. man, there's so many fighters out there, and there's there's that same mentality of like there's not there's no depth, there's nothing. Yep. No, you're right. You know, like. And, and, and it's like, and it's an old record that needs to be broken, you know, yep. like, and it's like, stop saying that guys, guys, stop mm -hmm. saying it. Cause it's not true, you know? Yeah. And, 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 um, and so you're kind of, to me, I'm like, I'm, you know, I'm so excited to get this interview with you because it's like, yeah, she was at the tough 28 show. We saw how that all turned out. Yeah. And, you know, the show's going on, but the tryouts and who they mm -hmm. picked, we saw all that all going. I was like, oh, that's still in that, that, that cycle. Okay. At least there's Invicta. And now you've got to kind of step in there again and say, hey, wait a minute, we're here, but now we're going to show you why we're here. Yeah. That, and well, to me, that's what, that's what you're, that's what is happening. Like this with you, with, with Pam. Um, well, I think every one of us feels that way too. Yeah, there's and and that's kind of what's interesting. With sort of, I don't want to say it's left the women's division, but I feel like before there was more acceptance. We kind of there was sort of this unspoken. Everybody was like, "Yeah, we're gonna show you guys what's up," you know. Um, and I feel like that is now happening uh, with the featherweights mm -hmm. because there is the, you know there is the threat of that getting folded and. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's just, there's always going to be, be more to be done, of course. And, and I think that's, that's the next big one is, okay. So, you know, prior to, prior to Invicta, they said women don't sell, women don't sell tickets. I'm sure you remember that. Yeah. Now, now it's the biggest, it's outside of the UFC and Fight Pass. It is the biggest property on Fight Pass. Yeah, that's why I have Fight Pass. I've had it since, I don't know how when, like since, since mm -hmm. Invicta came on the scene. Otherwise, I probably never would have got it, you know? It's because it's yeah. of Invicta. Um, and, it, and then Rhonda came through. And I think those two things yeah. together yeah. made people take notice. So it's like, all right, so now let's get some together and make people take notice of the featherweight women. Yeah. I, I had a quick question about the 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 two ways because I you you've interacted with both of these fighters with Rhonda and Gina and how mm -hmm. they came onto the scene and they were kind of you know they rose up and then you know took some hits some, oh, some yeah. hard hits it wasn't even just hits in the cage it was such a public kind of because they were like put on this pedestal the two of them mm -hmm. and you know what's your take on how they left. You know, it's really, it's something that bothers me a lot because I feel like you see this everywhere. If a, a woman loses, I feel like when men lose, then there's still a fighter that lost. But for some reason, when women lose, they can sometimes be, lose or shoot, have a bad day in the gym. Like they're, they're demoted to like not even a fighter. Like she was never good. And I can't believe that is the most nonsensical thing I've ever heard. Yeah. Uh, it was Rhonda in particular. She cleaned out that division. 
Yeah. Cleaned it out. And every time she would fight somebody, uh, she fought eating gums like super early. Was it her first pro fight or something? Yeah. It was super yeah. early. Yeah. It's like, oh, she just hasn't fought somebody who grappled. It's just yeah. nonsense. And then she'd fight a striker. Oh, she wasn't that good. Like every time hmm. there was some excuse about it. Hmm. Um, and yeah, good fighters lose to other good fighters sometimes, but it doesn't demote them from, from not being the great fighter they were. Yeah, exactly. I'm still a great fighter. Um, and I think, you know, we had talked, spoke a little bit about the American attitude about loss. I think that's part of it, but man, it seems way worse for women, way worse for some reason. Um, it's, it's very strange. So yeah, I think the, uh, I think the public reaction was appalling. And frankly, any, any coach who's trying to say she was never good doesn't know what they were watching. Yeah. yeah. Same, same here. I mean, I, I remember sitting at a table and people were rooting for her to lose. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Women were. And yeah. I, and I just, I was like, are you flipping kidding me? Do you know what this woman, this, this woman has done? Yeah. Is it's doing amazing. And you're, you're sitting here going to this gym because of her, I bet, on any way. Oh, I don't like her attitude. She's too cocky or she's too, mm -hmm. because she, she, she's not apologizing for herself for once. How yep. often? This is just, just, you know, like, this is just a thing. Okay. You're bringing it out of me. But how often have you been, and I know this is how I started training. I would be in my whatever gym training with some guy or whatever, and I would punch him and then immediately apologize. This is when I first began my martial yeah. arts training. And I would immediately apologize. Oh my God, I'm so sorry that I'd laugh. <laughs> you know? Yeah, like, well, and that's... Um, and I was like, is that a conditioned response yeah. from me mm -hmm. from early childhood? And this is something I've been questioning. I was like, is this something that was conditioned in me? Because I see so many women do that. Now I don't do it. Like yep. now I don't. But it takes a while, right? To like yeah. get out of habit. And yeah. it is interesting how men and women alike had such an issue with her not shaking a hand. Yeah. Meanwhile, Conor McGregor goes and throws, what do you throw? A dolly through a yeah. windshield? Yeah. And he's getting less hate. That makes no sense. Exactly. At all. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. The whole Misha Tate thing. But because she's not a nice girl. And I get along with Misha. I'm not. Yeah, no, I know. And, and I know. I, I completely understand the whole thing, but it was. You're really that mad because she flipped somebody off and didn't want to shake her hand. Really? It's, it's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. It, it is. It is weird. But women definitely were having an issue with that. And I was like, are you kidding me? She is standing up for so many things that are just, you know, I, I just always felt like. You know, she even, you know, labeled herself. She's Ronda Rousey. I'm rowdy. You know, like I'm, I am a bad girl. I come out with the bad girl image. I'm like, you know, can't you just see how this is just, you know, playing to the culture mm -hmm. and people couldn't see it. They would get so absorbed. It's really fascinating. But I just wanted to see yeah. you, you, I mean, like what you felt and saw, and I think most, most fighters that actually, you know, came up and watched the whole thing of both of the women, um, mm -hmm. in their fights that they feel basically the same way. But to Gina, she really kind of went off and I mean, it was, you know, we never saw her after Cyborg and, and it was like, oh, wow. What, you know, like still would have liked to have seen her fight or maybe yeah, fights out of her. I Same. Yeah. And, you know, I, you know, I don't know. It's not as though I've, I've yeah, asked. Right. No, I know. I know. You, but, you know, I wonder if, if it hadn't been such a crappy experience, you know, if, if the fans wouldn't make these things such a crappy experience, maybe we would mm. see more fighters. Cause uh, it seems to be really tough for people when they take a loss mm. in general, that public to, to bounce back from it. Yeah. Uh, it was for me, like the amount of hate you get because yeah. you lost in front of 5 million people against Gina. Yeah. And, the amount of weird hate you get from it is really strange. Yeah. Um, yeah. I did a whole podcast and I was laying F bombs on the misogyny and like whatever. Yeah. And, and, and I, I just couldn't even cool. hold back the F bombs on different people. Yeah, those two are so famous. Like, and everybody, like, oh. Everybody's just, um, I, I don't know why they feel like they have, have license to yeah dislike them so much yeah and i i do see it i i mean i guess i'm not reading the the guys threads guys do get it too 
Uh, they, they hate oh, yeah, and I'm not stuff like that. They do, but it, it's still like just wow. Like some of the stuff, although it has improved. I, I had heard you even saying it's like you know now they're actually looking at women for their skills instead mm -hmm. of saying oh I want to I want to you know have sex with her or something like that. I like to have sex with that yeah. particular fighter. Now they're like oh she's got skills, man. Like you see her knees, you see her elbows, and yeah, she's, yeah. whatever. Jitsu is like crazy, you know. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. So it's cool. It is cool. Um, I have a question that, uh, oh, well, how do you see yourself as a role model for girls and young women coming up? Oh, you know, I hope. Man, that's a good question. Um, you don't ever think of yourself as like a, a role model, you know, uh, but I, I hope that they, I hope that I don't have to be one. I, I hope that it's frequent enough that one doesn't stand out. Mm. One woman fighting or one woman matchmaking or, or doing whatever. I, ho I hope that there's enough of that going on that huh. one won't stand out anymore and be a role model because it's just what women do. I haven't heard anybody say that. That was like huge, Caitlin. <laughs> That's a big one. Wow. I mean, you just took my breath away with that because I haven't heard anybody say that. And that that's actually very evolved, hugely evolved thinking. Uh, yeah. Wow. That that's above and beyond even my my thought of anything because I, I we're always saying it. Do you see yourself as a role model? Mm -hmm. It's like, wouldn't it be great if if um you know, these opportunities are offered across the board and, and we don't have to be because we're all. It's not special anymore. Yeah, it's not that special. And we're, we're, we have these opportunities consistently across the board. That's just amazing. That's a great, great answer. That's what I hope. Yay, I like it. Oh, that's just my little bells going off. Whoops. Um, how important um, is having resilience and courage in the fight game? It's very important. It's maybe the most important thing. Right? Because mm. everybody's going to struggle with different stuff. You know, everybody's going to come up, especially if they stay in a long time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's something that you, you develop if you're staying in it and, and being introspective and looking at. Because um, I think in, in a lot of ways, it takes a lot of courage to be honest with yourself. Mm -hmm. And it's not easy to do, but of course, you know, on anything in life, when you're, when you're able to do that, you'll see better results. Yeah. Do you find that, I mean, over the course of your career that it's changed for you and, and you, you've matured into say a greater sense of, um, you know, resilience, overcoming things, and then the courage to kind of like move forward. Like this, this whole, like where you are now, like, I mean, four years ago where you were kind of like a little sounds like a little lost, you know, like, mm -hmm. uh, you're like I got to re Absolutely. myself. I have to mm -hmm. refine myself. And, and how do I go about that? And, and what did it take for you to, you know, to, to, to walk away? I mean, that took courage to kind of walk away too. Right. Well, it becomes such a, uh, I think it becomes such a part of your identity if you do it for a long time. Mm -hmm. But it's, for me, it's always, it comes down to, you know, when you're in a rock and a hard place, but like, what's the alternative? Mm -hmm. I, I just kind of toward the end there, I felt like I was just beating my head against the wall. So it was like, well, you got to change something. So I actually gave up a really awesome job. I was managing a, a, a general manager of a big, a good gym in um, uptown mm -hmm. Minneapolis. And I was like, I have a window. I have to have to go figure this out. And that's when I went out there and then stepped away and it, it took a lot longer than I was anticipating, but I, you know, it was a long way around, but I found it. Um, and I think being willing to sort of commit because a lot of things take that we're really after take a lot longer than, than you think they're going to at the onset of it. Mm. I have so many other questions for you too about like, you know, I mean, we're just talking the, the fight game, like in, in staying true to that aspect of yourself, but there's all these other aspects that people have that we have as, as, as human beings, yeah. we have our, you know, our family life, 
we have whatever um, career, you know, if, if we can be full time as a fighter or mm -hmm. do you supplement it through some other income? And then, you know, your spiritual background, your, your, um, the recreational, which I think is going to fall under the fighter and the athlete when you, but like, and, and then too, you know, your intimate relationships, how does that affect you when you're making these choices? It must be yeah. like, I mean, hugely like you, you, you're, you're doing your prioritizing yeah. again, right? Well, and so, uh, Ryan and I have been together thir 13 years now, almost 13 years. And we met at the gym and it's sort of, <clears throat> I don't know that it would, would work with somebody who wasn't. And I hate to say that because it could be something else. I suppose mm -hmm. if they had something else, they were really committed to, but also he's, he's a coach, right? So he's mm -hmm. um, putting in similar hours and making similar sacrifices to what I'm doing. And we've kind of always just had the understanding that, we're always there for each other, but that comes first. Now, of course, it'd be different if one of us be, like fell ill and we had to take care of each other. But, mm -hmm. but they're, I mean, we're both putting our career first quite often. The nice thing is we have a lot of overlap, but yeah, uh, it's been functioning like that from day one. It's fighting's more important. So yeah, and you both know that. Yep. Yeah, and, and that's really what makes it work. I think is that yeah. we're both we both know that that's the case and, and just try to support the other one in their pursuit. Mm -hmm. And, and for like, um, you know, this is, this is so different for women to choose like, you know, well, it's not different for women to choose career over say maybe a family life or anything mm -hmm. like that, but does that ever come up for you? Do you ever think that as a woman that you want to have children and, and how this type of lifestyle would probably be a little like some women do have the kids and they're, they're fine. Like as, as fighters, do you ever consider that or is that not part of your, yeah, I don't think I will. Um, but yeah, that's the tough thing, right? Your prime fighting years or your prime childbearing years too. Yeah. So I, I empathize with the women who are having to make that choice. Yeah, for sure. Um, because it would be very difficult. There's some things that are great. You know, most gyms are really kid friendly. Mm-hmm but having to take a year and a half or, or whatever, what have you off. Um, and then there's some changes that happen and some women still fight great, but there's some changes that happen to your ligaments and stuff that, that aren't reversible. Um, mm -hmm. so yeah, I think for them, it, it definitely is, is a balance. And I think that's why we have less super, you know, we don't have, uh, too many female like Dan Henderson's or Randy Couture's. And I think part of that is that women are always having to cut them short if they want to have kids. Cause unfortunately we're just not uh, biologically equal in that sense. Like one of us has to do the carrying and, and it's the ladies. So mm -hmm. um, I think it, it has had somewhat of an effect on, on the women's game. Yeah. I, I think it's interesting too, that you see, well, maybe not so much in other sports, but in, in, and maybe it's just because I'm watching mixed martial arts or whatever, but there's a lot of female, um, you know, female partnerships and yep. oh, yeah. And, yeah. And I'm like, well, one could, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. like, but I just find it fascinating that it doesn't happen in other, you don't see it so much in other sports with um, so much as you do yeah. in, in this, this particular sport lately. It seems like every time I turn on, it's like, oh, there are a couple, there are a couple, there are a couple. Yeah, found it fascinating. I'm like, it, well, and I wonder, like maybe it, I don't know, maybe women who are fighting are a little, a little bit higher testosterone than the average. <laughs> no, I don't know. Yeah, maybe yeah. it's related. Yeah, I don't know either. Um, were you ever told no or kept from doing something that you wanted to because you were a woman, and how did you handle it? Yeah, that's uh, that's actually how I got into fighting. Believe it or not. Oh. I'd gotten in trouble and my mom told me um, I had to choose an activity huh. and I wanted to play football and uh, the boys coach was going to let me do it, but she was afraid I'd get hurt because I was a girl. So now, <laughs> wow. now I'm playing professionally and my mom has since um, huh. changed her mind about a lot of stuff, but well, I'm sure, but, wow. uh, but yeah. Sounds like you gave your mom a run for her money there. 
<laughs> yeah, not probably not what she bargained for. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> She's like, what am I gonna do with this girl? <laughs> It's funny, like in the last year or two, she's finally like started enjoying watching fights. I think she had a really hard time at first, but uh, but now she she she's watching and learning a lot about scoring. So I think it's more interesting for her. Yeah, she's got to know the game, and then it becomes way more interesting. I think, right. to understand it because I think if if uh, any uh, like I watch my son, but if I think if my daughter you know, and I didn't know what I know. And she was, mm -hmm. she was sparring or like in a fight or something like that. I'd be like, oh, I yeah. can't watch. No, know? exactly. I, I be, bring me a pillow and I can cover my face during the terrifying parts where she's getting pummeled. Okay. You know? I would feel awful. I, no, I, do no. that, I do that with my favorite fighters. I'm like, I just can't watch. And then I'll watch later, you know, even mm -hmm. though, but I can watch a fight, but if I, if I know them, I'm like, oh God, okay, I can watch. It's crazy. Um, so any parting words of wisdom or like a little infomercial on Caitlin Young on what's coming up or any shout outs to anybody, now would be the time to do it. Sure, okay. Uh, yeah, I would just say don't let anybody, oh my gosh, don't let anybody discourage you. If you got a coach telling you you're just not a fighter, then they probably just don't know how to help somebody and, and you need to move on. Mm -hmm. um, shout out, I'll shout out to my sponsors, uh, Zebra Mats, Menacing Valor, Mr. Mouthguard, Cardinal Carpet Care. Uh, thank them for their support. They've all been helping me out since I was doing Muay Thai, now coming into to MMA, which is more visible. So um, I definitely appreciate them for being being with me for the long haul. And then uh, to Corn Pet for being an awesome coach. And then um, Ryan Murray for dealing with all of it. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So thank you so much for being on the show. I really enjoyed getting to know you. And I, I'm excited for your upcoming fight at Invicta. Um, we'll see that. That airs, um, I think, November 16th. Yeah, know. November 16th. It is the 16th, and we'll be able to fight, uh, see it on Fight Pass. And um, I can't wait to see uh, you fight again. Thanks. I can't wait. And yeah, everyone should tune in and see, see about this featherweight division we're talking about. Will you be matchmaking too? In the, no. You're, yeah. done with, you're done with it now. You're back in the fight game. You're there. Yep, absolutely. Okay. All right, cool. Well, thank you again, Caitlin. Thank and you. Great having you on the show. Wow, what a great interview with Caitlin Rose Young. She really blew me away with her answer to my question about um, how do you see yourself as a role model to women? I, I didn't expect that answer from her to say that she really didn't want to think of herself as a role model. It was such a great answer. Um, you know, that she'd rather see, you know, equal opportunities for women and that it wasn't such a, you know, not the norm anymore she, she wanted to see you know women you know other women having opportunities to be fighters and matchmakers and that it was kind of you know all across the board like normal like normal kind of stuff i thought that was awesome so i'm looking forward to seeing her fight at invicta fc 32 where she'll be fighting against zara fan dos santos coming um, November 16th. So watch out for that on Fight Pass. And um, I'm wishing her, a, you know, a great career path as she moves forward in the fight game. So if you like what you heard today and are eager to hear more, remember to subscribe or download on iTunes. Or better yet, you can 10x your energy without destroying your body with my three free, <laughs> my free three part video series. Oh, another tongue twister, I'm telling you. And um, with that, you'll be included um, on our email list where you'll receive uh, where you can find the podcast easy enough when it first comes out. So um, you can check that out at my website at evolvewma.com. You can find it there. The other thing, uh, you can now see us on YouTube 
Uh, so all of the interviews are also on YouTube if you have the chance to, you know, sit down and watch and you want to see my mug and, and uh, the fighters that I'm interviewing, you can see us at YouTube at Women's MMA. And then just recently, which I was really excited about because you have to get accepted, is uh, you can now find us and listen in on Spotify. Yes, we're on Spotify under, just uh, type it in, Evolve Women's MMA, and we will come up and we'll have all our episodes there. So you can listen in, you can catch up on some of the old ones. And um, if you'd like to become a patron, I am on Patreon, would love some donations, would love some patrons to start, you know, kind of giving me some feedback. Right now, everything on there is is open. You can look at it all, but eventually I'm going to be just having some things just for patrons only. Um, or simply, you can follow us on facebook.com backslash I love WMMA. This is Shelly Devine. Until next time, thanks for listening.